Good afternoon, everyone. This is Sherry Cudd. I'm the Advertising and Marketing Manager for Chase Plastics, and I wanted to welcome all of you to our next uh, Chase the Knowledge here on understanding TPE types uh, and advantages. Uh, hopefully, you can see our screen and you can hear me well. Uh, if you cannot, if you could please just raise your hand and uh, we can unmute you. Um, also, you can type a question at any time and we'll be able to read those at the end. Um, but uh, let's see here. Okay, so our next Chase the Knowledge event is now scheduled for Wednesday, May 5th. You can register for the next event by going to chaseplastics.com slash webinars, and you'll see that event there where you can register for it. You can also see all of our past webinar recordings there as well, so you can watch those at your leisure. Um, our next Chase the Knowledge webinar will be on styrenic thermoplastics, four polymers and benefits of each, and this will be the first part of a series of those that we will be doing. Um, if you would like to attend, but you're not really sure yet if, if that will be a good day for you, still, I, I would still highly recommend that you register for the events because even if you cannot attend, you will be able to receive a recording of it afterwards to watch at your leisure. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Jason Merkel, our technical manager, to kick off today's event. Jason. Thank you, Sherry, I appreciate it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Chase and Knowledge event. As Sherry mentioned, my name is Jason Merkel, and I'm the technical manager here at Chase. Uh, we put together this Chase and Knowledge platform several years ago as a way to help educate our customers on various aspects of the technical world. Um, traditionally, we've given these presentations in person, but um, here we are to present to you today virtually. Here at Chase, we strive to be a materials and processing consultant as much as a resin distribution company. Our team of technical development engineers is standing by to help with any of your product selection, design, testing, or troubleshooting needs. We come from a variety of technical backgrounds and experience, and we welcome the opportunity to provide insight on any of your projects and problems, whether they be large or small. I hope you find this presentation helpful in understanding the common types of thermoplastic elastomers we see in the market. We'll continue to follow up with other Chase the Knowledge events in the future on various technical topics. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Andrea Kendrick, Technical Development Engineer with Chase Plastics. Andrea is based out of our Clarkston, Michigan headquarters and supports several regions with technical service and application development. Andrea has her bachelor's degree in plastics engineering technology from Ferris State University, and she's been with Chase Plastics for six years. Andrea, take it away. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you guys are from. Uh, today we're going to talk about understanding TPE types and advantages. Uh, before I get started, if you guys see kind of on the side where it says handouts, if you want to either download the presentation right now and follow along, we also have our line card is on there, but then we also have the soft choice choice one pager, which I will reference occasionally. Um, it kind of goes over our TPEs and what's out there um, as, as well as some advantages of them. So you can view that as we're going along and talking about them, kind of look at them at the same time. So I'll go and get started. So today we're going to go over TPEs, overview just what they are, and then we're going to talk about the classification. So what are the different types? We're going to go over their chemistry a little bit. We're going to talk about some advantages and limitations of, of a few of them, the ones that are a little more common. We're going to talk about overmolding just a little bit because it's a really huge market for TPEs. As I'm sure you're thinking, these soft touch materials, that's generally the first thing that pops into your head is something that's used as a nice overmold in an application. And then we're going to talk about some other application examples as well. So you kind of get an idea of where these play in the market. So we'll start with polymers in general. So I'm sure a lot of people have heard poly is many, MERS mean unit, so many units. So there's a few different types of polymers out there. You have your thermoplastics, which I would venture to say the majority of us are most familiar with. There are um, what you'd call maybe the hard plastics, so your ABSs, your polyamides, your PCs, the ones we see most commonly. Then you have your elastomers, so these are going to be your rubbers, your thermoset materials uh, that if you just do injection molding of thermoplastics, you're not super familiar with, uh, but those are another type of polymer. And then your thermosets uh, that are not elastomers. And then thermoplastic um, elastomers, they kind of play into being a 
being able to be processed like a thermoplastic, but have a little bit more of the characteristics of an elastomer. They're stretchy, they're soft. Um, and so, and then they can also be reprocessed, which is nice. Whereas your rubbers, once they cross link, you cannot reprocess them. They're, they, they're in that shape, whatever you made them, they're staying. So that's where these have a nice play in the market, a little bit different. So an overview of TPEs, almost all TPEs contain two or more distinct polymeric phases and their properties are gonna depend on those phases being mixed. And so, and then also the other thing that will play into them is what we have as the hard segment and the soft segment of those materials will also play into their properties and how they perform. TPEs, like I said, contain one hard and one soft segment. And the idea is that when they're at room temperature or they're just in standard environment, they're stable like a thermoplastic and then they heat up and the thermoplastic hard segment will start to flow, allowing it to be processed like a standard thermoplastic versus a rubber. Classification, so what are the common TPEs that you're gonna see out there? You have your copolyester elastomers, you have your styrenic based TPEs, thermoplastic vulcanizates, thermoplastic polyurethanes, polyether block amides, polyurethane elastomer block copolymers, Thermoplastic polyolefin blends and thermoplastic silicone vulcanizates are the majority of what we see. Um, something that you will not notice on here is your TPOs. Maybe you guys have worked with those in the past. Those typically stay on the classification of a standard thermoplastic just because there's such a small amount of the rubber being added as more of an additive for it. So you'll not see those on this page. And then what we'll do a little bit later in our presentation is we'll focus on the top four because those are the most common. So we'll get an idea of how they are different their limitations, how they play different applications. I wanna talk about the chemistry just a little bit. Uh, when you start to break down all of the different thermoplastic elastomers, there's three different types of their chemistry or kind of how they're made up. You have your styrenic thermoplastic elastomers, your hard polymer elastomer combinations, and then your multi-block polymers with crystalline hard segments. So we'll kind of talk about each one and give you an example, the examples of which TPEs fall into those categories. Styrenic thermoplastic elastomers, so the hard segment, again, we just talked about as a hard segment, has a soft segment. The hard segment of these ones is going to be polystyrene. Your soft segments are going to be butadiene, isoprene, there's a few others as well. But essentially what these are, they're black copolymers where you have ABA structure, A being your polystyrene, B being your elastomer, so they're a black copolymer in that sense. At room temperature, polystyrene are going to act as hard and physical cross links, so they keep it together as, as a uh, polymer. And then at elevated temperatures, the polystyrene will lose their integrity and flow. So like you would with a standard thermoplastic, it'll flow and allow you to process it again as a standard thermoplastic. So some examples of these materials would be your pure SEBS, SBCs, SISs, um, just your standard pure styrenic ones. And then you have hard polymer and elastomer combinations. So sometimes when you'll hear the term, I do want to take a second to mention this, when you hear the term TPE slash S, your styrenic based ones, most of the time we take that initial step and we make those styrenic based ones, your SEBs, your SISs, and then we will blend it in this fashion with a polypropylene. And so this gives us a slightly different version of it, but continues to open the range of properties and available options for these materials. So what we'll take for these ones in this particular case, um, the majority of your blends are gonna be propylene based for the hard segment. EPDM as a soft segment or SCBS, SIS. And then what we do is then we blend them and they're, they become um, co-continuous phases within the morphology of the polymer. And so we do extensive mixing for those. The, your TPES is, like I said, the standard SCBS is you blend with the propylene to make your styrenic based TPEs how we typically think of them when we think of a styrenic based TPE. And then the other version of this is going to be when we blend, but then we also deliberately cross-link some of the material. So in this case, it would be the EPDM. We deliberately cross-link it in a mixing um, process called dynamic vulcanization. So if you recognize that term, we're talking about TPVs here, thermoplastic vulcanizates. And so we do the mixing and the dynamic vulcanization, and then we make a TPV in this case. And the reason that we do that is your cross-linked elastomer is going to become insoluble. So it's gonna have better oil resistant and your gas resistance is gonna improve. And then also it makes it so that EPDM section in your material, it's not gonna flow and it's also not gonna move under stress and high temperature. So you're gonna improve properties like your compression set and your tear and stuff like that, where you think of more of a standard property for 
a rubber, you're going to improve those by cross-linking the EPDM in that blend. And then lastly, we have multi-block polymers with crystalline hard segments. So if we go back to the last one, you had your propylene, which would be your crystalline, and then your amorphous um, uh, soft segments. And then in this one, we have your polyurethanes, polyesters, and polyamides as the hard segment instead of propylene. And then our soft segments are typically based out of either esters or ethers. And so this is what we would do to make TPUs or COPEs, copolyester elastomers. And so essentially what happens here is you have your hard segments that are going to be crystalline and then your soft elastic sections are amorphous. They're similar to the styrenic ones that we talked about as far as their uh, structure being the black copolymers. The difference being the hard domains are crystalline versus amorphous with your polystyrene. So I want to touch on hardness a little bit. If you were available or watched in the past the presentation I gave on data sheets, you'll recognize this slide. So the biggest thing that we talk about, um, aside from maybe some of the other more rubber-like properties, is going to be your hardness of your material. It's one of the really big distinguishing differences between all the different grades. And so hardness is really a measure of how much it'll resist being indented by an indentor. Uh, so essentially, if you're thinking about holding a piece of rubber in your hand and you try to press down with it with your fingernail, that's going to be the hardness, how much it resists allowing you to push into it. So the harder it resists or the harder it feels, the higher hardness it's going to have. And so what does that look like typically on a data sheet? You'll see something, either durometer A, which are used for your softer materials. Typically speaking, we see them at under 90A. And then your durometer D is going to be for your harder materials, so short Ds of 20 or higher. Sometimes you'll kind of see a mix where you'll see maybe a 95A or 100A, but that's generally speaking where they tend to fall for hardness. So you know if you're looking at something with a short D of 30, 40, it's going to be harder than something with a short A of 30 or 40. And then there is a, a area which they will overlap a little bit, but soft materials are going to be short As, hard materials short Ds. And so what does that kind of all look like for these different materials that we're talking about? We'll get into it a little bit more as well, but this is a nice little piece and graph that you'll find on the soft touch one pager that's uh, available for you to download. And so if you look at the top, you have your COPEs. They're a little bit harder of a material. Again, we'll talk about that a little bit further as we dig into them a little bit. Your EVAs, your flexible PVCs, TPUs, and then you'll see a nice wide range for your SBCs and styrenic TPEs and then TPVs, really nice broad range you'll see there on their hardness scale. So the hardness, as you can imagine, is gonna depend on the ratio of your hard phase, your hard plastic, to your soft phase, so how much of each you have. So for styrenic-based TPEs, because you're doing a block combination, if you have a lot more of the S, you start to have more of a continuous phase of styrene, and less of the butadiene or whatever rubber is used in that case. Um, and if you get to where you have too much of the styrene, what happens is then you get a continuous segment of styrene with little dispersions of butadiene, and that's actually how you get SPCs. So your um, styrenic black copolymer materials, your Q resin and your, and your K resin, that's how you make those. And so what's nice about that is because you're able to kind of start to do different ratios, it does allow for a very wide range of hardnesses to be achieved with this material. So you have a lot of styrene versus a little bit butadiene or a little bit more butadiene, less styrene. So you get to the point where you can have a really nice wide range of hardnesses. Typically you see, you can see double zero A to about 100 A and then even maybe a little bit harder as well, but that's pretty standard. Again, nice wide range, which you'll see comes into play a little bit as we talk about some of the other materials that the range is not as high. And then for your crystalline-based TPE, so again, these are the blends that we talked about, ones that have your propylene hard segments, and then your uh, multi-black copolymers, where you have your urethanes and your amides as the hard segment. What happens is if you start to get too much elastomer in the morphology, you're starting to have too much of a rubber that's not vulcanized or doesn't have enough strength by itself. So you're going to end up with a material that has no strength and basically no use. So you can only get so soft. You can only have so much elastomer in that phase without there being a problem. And then in the other way, if you use something like your vulcanizate, so this would be your EPDMs that have been cross-linked. If you have too much of that, 
you start to hinder the ability for it to flow. Because as we mentioned, once you start to cross link on purpose, the EPDM, you start to not allow it to flow so much, which does give it some of its properties. But if you have too much of it, you're not gonna be able to flow the material at all, which is the advantage of TPEs, which is being able to be processed in standard equipment like thermoplastics. So in this, you'll typically see ranges, which 25A is still pretty soft, uh, but you'll see it does not get down all the way to the double A, like your styrenic base as well, all the way up to a 72D. So with all of that and with all this information and all these different combinations and all these different types, you can start to imagine that when you say TPE and you say, you know, I just need TPE for my application, there's such a wide range of properties available and different hardnesses, different performances, that it becomes difficult to just say, hey, I need a TPE. You have to start to specify a little bit more. And then we can start to figure out what's important to the application and start tailoring what we're looking for to that. And so, like we've mentioned before, your selection of hard and soft segments is going to, is going to in, influence your property selection. There's also other things to be aware of. If we're going to have additives, we can sometimes add, you know, fillers that's going to increase the specific gravity. So then maybe they cost a little bit less. You might have stuff like different types of mineral oil that you're using to affect the hardness as well. So there's this nice blend of a lot of different things, and we can start tailoring that. And by we, I mean our manufacturers, of course, can kind of tailor that and start to get you where you need to be from a property performance standpoint. But again, the big thing here is, if you just say we need a TPE, it's not enough to get us where we need to go because there's such a wide range of performance for us. And then you'll also notice here, I did include a link. So this is actually to go to our product literature page on the Chase Plastics website. It gets you to where you can download the soft choice one pager. If you haven't done so already, you can do it you know, later. So now we're going to talk about the, like I mentioned, the four top materials. We're going to talk about them a little bit more in depth and go over some of their advantages and limitations because these are the ones you're going to see most commonly. So we want to make sure that you guys are aware of them and how they perform. So your copolyester elastomers called COPEs. Sometimes you'll see them as TPEE, TPCs. They have the crystalline hard segment, your polyester, and a polar elastomer segment, your polyether. So this would be, again, as we kind of mentioned, your multi-block copolymers. And then the other thing that's unique about this material is that it's got a nice, really low glass transition of negative 60 C. So it actually allows COPE materials to have excellent low temperature ductility. A lot of them and a lot of these materials, because of the rubber elastomer segments, have really low TGs, way under room temperature. So in the negative 60s, negative 50s, negative 40s. So it allows it for really good performance, or I should say continued uh, flexible performance and good impact at low temperatures. And so that's something you'll see across the board for a lot of these materials. And then the other thing to note when we're talking about the two different hard segments, the soft being the TG would be the low end kind of, if you want to call it a service temperature. And then the high would be either your TG or TM of the hard segment. So that's something you want to be aware of when they're combined together like this, you're going to see a performance of both segments. So the low temperature when you're talking about service temperature for these grades would be TG of your elastomer and then your TM or TG of the hard segment is kind of your service temperature of what the expectation would be for these different materials. So like I mentioned, copolyester elastomers, also called TPEE, TPC, and sometimes you'll see TPE slash E. The hardness range for these ones are going to be 25D to 75D. So as I mentioned, the D being on the harder end of the scale. And so what that comes with, those advantages and limitations, it's got good service temperature, your continuous use temperature, that's what CUT is for, uh, about 125C. They do have some specialty grades that can get a little bit hotter, but that's generally kind of where we set the expectation for it. They've got great resistance to greases and oils. This is going to be because of your crystalline hard segment. They have good resistance to that. So it allows the overall composition of the TPE to have good resistance to greases and oils. It's got great tear resistance and compression set, the low temperature ductility that we talked about. And then some of the limitations is you're limited to the higher hardness. So if you have an application where you want to be in a 60A or a 40A or something much softer, it's not going to be achievable with this type of material. You have to utilize a harder material for this. And then the other limitation would be its cost. It, it performs well. It's got good performance. It's going to cost you a little bit more money for it. So something to keep in mind. The trade names for this type of material would be Keyflex or Skypel are some common ones that you might see. 
your styrenic based TPEs. So pure styrenic TPEs, so this would be your SEV, S, your SEPS, these are the ones without the propylene. They have the amorphous hard segments and the soft segments that are also amorphous. They are soluble in common solvents. So overall, these pure ones without anything blended in them, they have really poor chemical resistance. So something to keep in mind that if you're looking for something that's got the better chemical resistance, you're probably not looking in this direction for these materials. And then if you compound these into crystalline or insoluble polymers like polypropylene, which generally speaking, when you're seeing a TPES, these are what we're referring to, ones that have already been blended in to polypropylene. You increase their chemical resistance and widen the performance range because the polypropylene adds that level of performance and uh, chemical resistance. So similar, we'll talk about applications a little bit, but one common application you're gonna see for this is something like an overmold for a screwdriver, for instance. Styronic based TPEs, so your SBSs, your SBCs is sometimes what you hear if they're not blended with your propylenes. The hardest range for these ones are going to be in the double A, uh, excuse me, double zero A to 93A. So a nice wide range for you to pick from. Uh, so some of the advantages in that case, because of the wide range, would be a broad hardness range. Uh, it's cost effective. So if your idea is, hey, I just need some soft touch somewhere, or I just need to be feel soft perfect for that type of application, unless you have a requirement for chemical resistance. As we mentioned, this is not great with chemical resistance being a limitation, greases, oils. Service temperature, it, it, we have it as a limitation. You can get up typically to about 100 C. It just depends on what environment the part's gonna be in. Generally speaking, I mean, if you're not going up to 100 C, it's great, but comparing it to like the COPE that had the higher continuous use temperature, this is on the lower end. So we would consider it more of a limitation for the overall realm of TPEs. And then some other advantages would be its colorability. These take color really well. So if you are, you know, you want that overmold and you want it to be green or fuchsia pink or, you know, whatever color you're looking for, they color very easily. And they also flow really well, which is nice. So it makes it they're, them pretty easy to process. They are great for overmolding capabilities. So as we talk about old overmolding in a little bit later, they have great capabilities there. They're able to be blended with certain additives that allow for overmolding to a huge range of different hard materials. And so these are a great option for that specifically. Some of the trade names you might see or have seen is gonna be your Thermalast, your Thermalast Ks, Monoprene, Telcar, Sarlink uh, for the automotive industry, TPEs, Sarlink. Thermoplastic polyurethanes, TPUs, uh, so standard TPUs, they are gonna be your multi-block, as we mentioned, where they've got the crystalline hard segment and the um, east, ether, or ether or ester soft segment. And then also with polyurethanes, they have three typical ones, uh, as far as the bases are concerned. They have TPUs that come in ester base. So what does that mean? It's good overall performance. It's got the improved oil and fuel resistance. Your ether grades of TPU are gonna have improved hydrolysis. Uh, so uh, water getting in and destroying the molecules, attacking it um, and breaking them down. So there'll be improved resistance to that. So if you're gonna see water with a little bit elevated temperature, better performance there. Uh, microbial resistance and then cold temperature performance is better with your um, ethers. And then lastly, we have caprolactone and they are a nice good blend between the two. We kind of have the best of both worlds there, as well as a little bit better heat performance and compression set. And then you can kind of see down the side, as you can imagine, as the performance is getting better, you're going to pay a little bit more for it. So, and then these would be standard aromatic TPUs. They also have aliophatic TPUs that I don't talk about as much here um, that have a little bit different performance. It's something that if need be, it could be a conversation that you have with, you know, one of the tech team shoot me an email, we can talk about it, but these would be the standard ones that you see most commonly and the different bases that they come in most commonly as well. So TPUs, sometimes you'll see PUR as their abbreviation. The short range for them is 60A to a 70D. Once you start getting down to the 60s and 70As, they become a little bit more specialized, so they're a little bit harder to find, um, but some overall performance of your TPU is gonna be your abrasion and scratch resistance. They have the best abrasion of all our TPEs. So if that's the key feature you need for your application, that's gonna be the material that we, we get you into. The service temperature is pretty good. CUT, continuous use temperature of up to 120 C. So if you remember our COPEs were 125, we're at about 120 for TPU, so really good performance. Um, low temperature ductility is really good. It's got good chemical resistance as well. 
uh, oil and gas resistance being better with your polyester grades. The one thing that, a couple of things that they're not so good at, they're not great with weatherability. So if your application is going to be outside consistently and you can't have any discoloring or anything like that, they're not so great with that. But if your key feature is abrasion, excellent for that type of application. They also are a little bit higher on the hardness range. So you see 60A, again, kind of specialized, might be difficult to find. But if you're needing something in the softer 40, 50 range, they're not going to have materials available for that. So something to consider when you're looking at what hardness you need for your application. Trade names that you're going to see, Avalon and Irogrand are the common ones for these materials. And then we have TPVs. So these are going to be your thermal plastic vulcanizate. So these are the ones where we specifically vulcanize or cross-link the EPDM rubber in it when we do the blend. These ones are going to be considered the most rubber-like. So if you're looking at a part, maybe you're at a shop, maybe you're wherever you're at, you pick up a part and you're like, man, this feels or could be like it's actually vulcanized rubber. And then you see maybe it's got some signs that it's injection molded. Maybe it's got gate, party line, whatever, what have you. Um, these are going to be the ones that appear most like it and are what we replace vulcanized rubber with the most is our TBVs. Because the elastomeric phase is dynamically vulcanized, so again, cross-linking the PDM, it starts to increase the solvent and oil resistance as well as the compression side of the material. So we kind of talked about how that tends to help with some of the performance for it. But what that leads to is that you're going to have much better grease and oil resistance compared to your TPES, which would be propylene blended with your styrenic soft segment, this one being your propylene blended with your EPDM. The EPDM has the better oil and res gas resistance, so overall TBVs have better resistance to those as well. You're going to see an improvement in compression set because of the cross-linking. It actually has a pretty decent hardness range available, so 25A to 45D, so a little bit wider range than you had seen from the COPs and the TPUs. It's also got really great heat aging. So these are used a lot in automotive applications where that could be something that's a requirement. The one thing that they're not so great at is they're not so great with abrasion. So again, if you're thinking abrasion, we go TPU. If you're thinking we need better compression set, maybe you need a lower hardness, but also some heat aging, TPVs are going to be there for you. And then the other thing is they're not as good with coloring as your TPEs are. So TPEs, a little bit lower heat range, but much better colorability. Your TPVs are going to have better heat aging and compression. What you would consider more of the rubber properties, it'll be better with TPV, but they won't be able to be colored quite as well. You can still get there, but it's just not as good. Uh, so a common trade name that you'll see out there is going to be Sarlink. Sarlink is the you know the market brand for automotive, but that's going to be your TPV and your TPE trade name. You'll just depending on what grade it is depends. We'll tell you what the material is. So next, I kind of, like I mentioned, I want to see you get into overmolding just a little bit. So if you guys have not experienced it or you don't run any overmolding, but you've seen some parts that have a soft touch handle or maybe it's a hammer with a grip or something where you can tell that there's one plastic with another overmolding onto it. I want to talk about that briefly because, again, this is a really common type of application that these materials get put into. So overmolding, it's a process of adding an additional layer of material over an already existing piece or part. So you can either achieve this via insert molding or multi-shot molding. And then reason we're talking about it, typically you do this with the TPE. The, um, sometimes you'll also see people call it multi-component injection molding, not to be confused with co-injection. That's a little bit different. That's not the same thing as this. Um, but sometimes you'll see multi-component or multi-shot or two-shot or insert molding. This is what we're referring to when they use those terms. So insert molding, what does that look like? Essentially, we insert the rigid plastic part and then it moves, well, we mold it and then we put it into a different mold and then we have the TPE um, over mold onto it. So what's nice about this is it's good for low volumes, but it means that you don't actually have to invest any, into any type of special or complicated machinery to do it. You take your part, you put it in, you let the material over mold onto it. Some similar insert molding, if you do anything with like uh, metal inserts or stuff like that, similar concept, but in this case, we put in the plastic to have the TPE over mold onto it. Then we have what's called multi-shot. So this is where you first make whatever hard plastic part you're making, and then the actual core of the machine comes out and rotates. And then there's another barrel that feeds in with the TPE that will then overmold onto it. So if you've ever looked up how maybe toothbrushes are made or something like that, they'll have videos where you can see that they make the toothbrush first, core shifts, and then they um, overmold the, thermo the thermoplastic 
elastomer onto that for the grip. These are really good for high volume programs. They're going to make a lot of parts and it's just going to cost way too much to have to keep inserting these parts in to have them over molded onto. This is the type of uh, process you do. Problem with this is that it does cost money to get specialized equipment to do it. But again, huge programs and huge uh, market area for RTPs is over molding. So some, cap some compatibility charts. So the few that we talked about, your COPE, um, Styronic, TPES, uh, TPUs, TPVs. This chart actually can be found again on our soft choice one pager. So if you've downloaded it, you'll see it on the second page. This gives you an idea of what you'll get chemical bonds to as far as when you go to overmold it. So your COPEs, they'll bond to some polar materials like your ABSs, your PCs, um, SANs. And then your TPES, you'll actually see some asterisks and you can see across the board, there's a good portion of these materials it will overmold onto without a problem. Um, sometimes you need a special grade, you have to add a special, you know, uh, it's like a additive that will allow it to adhere to these materials, but you have the ability to do it. TPUs, TPVs, you'll notice it only pretty much bonds to olefins because it's got the propylene hard segment. It's gonna wanna bond to the propylene or polyethylene because it's the same material. And then the one thing I will note here, so these would be your chemical bonds. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're limited to that. You just will have to do something like include a mechanical interlock in the material to have it uh, bond or hold on to it longer. So again, this is on the one, the soft choice one pager. So go ahead and download that if you want to reference that later. Some typical applications for these materials. Um, so we talked about the four different main ones and then we had pictures of each application, but here's some other applications that you'll see these pretty commonly in. So your COPEs, you're gonna see um, in caster wheels. They're big for um, CDJ boots, hydraulic hoses. Um, they've got really good flex fatigue performance. So you're gonna see them in kind of applications like that. Your TPE assays, you're gonna see as a lot of just standard, hey, I need an over molding material. You'll see it in screwdriver handles, um, baby teething toys, so either an overmold maybe onto a propylene egg or maybe it's by itself. You see that a lot. Toothbrush overmolds where you just need the grip. TPUs, you'll see a lot in your rollerblade wheels. Big thing being because of the abrasion, you're going to, if you're out rollerblading on a sidewalk, it's going to see a lot of that scratching on it. Disc golf frisbees, we make out of TPU a lot. Cable jacketing. Uh, TPVs, you'll see a lot in weather stripping. Um, gaskets and seals, stuff for automotive and that nature, and then also use quite a bit for gun butt stocks. So you'll see those in those types of applications as well. And then that actually, I'm done early for you guys, um, but that concludes kind of the overview of our TPE. So at this point, I'm going to kind of let Jason come back in and, and go over a couple of things, and then we're going to open the floor for questions for you guys. I want to leave some time if you guys had some questions for us. Awesome. Thank you, Andrea. Um, just wanted to reiterate, as we mentioned at the, the beginning of the presentation, that our next Chase the Knowledge event will be taking place on Wednesday, May 5th at 2 p.m. Eastern. So we hope you all are able to make that. We're going to focus on uh, styrenic thermoplastics uh, to start. This is the beginning of a, of a series that we're going to have, uh, giving an overview of certain areas of the, the polymer world. So the first will be styrenics focusing on um, four polymers we see most commonly used in the market uh, of ABS, ASA, MABS, or transparent ABS, and SAN. Uh, we'll go over how they how they differ in terms of chemistry and what that means for end use products and, and performance. So we uh, we hope to see you all again on Wednesday, May fifth. Uh, moving forward, um, there is going to be a survey coming out after the presentation that I hope you all can take so we can find out how we can make these presentations more effective and useful for all of you. Um, so if you could complete that, that would be greatly appreciated. You can also see here Andrea's contact information, both phone and email address, should you have any questions relating to uh, this presentation or if we can help with anything at all related to the plastics technical world, we'd, uh, we'd be happy to do so. Uh, recording this webinar will be emailed to you uh, in about an hour along with a copy of um, the presentation and a certificate of completion. So we appreciate you guys taking your time to spend with us today. Um, at this point, if you have any questions, please uh, enter them in the, the questions section of the, uh, the webinar um, heading. If, if not, you can uh, raise your hand and I can unmute you if necessary. Uh, we can have you ask the question directly. Um, 
Andrea, one question we do have right now is how do TPEs handle uh, reprocess, reprocessing and regrind? Um, so I would say kind of standard like you would have for your thermoplastics. Uh, typically, we want to keep it under 20% if you're going to add it back in. So 20% with, you know, your 80% uh, virgin. And then typically we want to see one run, but they tend to perform pretty similarly as you would expect your thermoplastics to. So they, it can be done. You can reintroduce it and still have it perform well. The best way to really do it though is for your specific application. If you're if you're planning or wanting to one regrind, again, you can, but do it in your application and figure out at what point of regrinding it or at what percent it starts to hinder the performance that you have of your actual part. Yeah, I'll add to that a little bit as well. Um, some of it comes down to how um, or what type of TPE specifically we're talking about. So certain TPEs are a little more um, shear sensitive than others. I'll use um, TPU or, or even flexible PVC as an example, where they would be a little more limited in the amount of regrind they would be able to handle, especially over multiple passes. Um, whereas other TPEs, such as uh, a TPV, a vulcanized material, you know, you're really not going to break down um, the vulcanized portion of the elastomer in that compound. Uh, via melt processing over and over again. So some TPVs can take uh, up to a high percentage of regrind and, and several passes, but uh, we've got some data on file. If there was ever a certain instance or material I'd like to take a look at, we could uh, get into the specifics offline as well. Uh, next question is, what material would you recommend for a hinge type application? Um, a hinge type application, I would probably go, I guess it depends on what the other requirements would be as well, but I would think you could get away with something like a TPE or a TPV. Um, you're going to have your propylene hard segment, which is what we typically recommend for those types of applications anyway. Um, but again, it would kind of depend on some of the other parts of the requirements, but you could start looking at those ones potentially. And then also what hardness you need. I mean, if you have a special, if you want it to have a certain performance or a certain hardness, we would want to know that as well because as I kind of mentioned throughout the presentation that then limits us depending on where you want to be. Yeah to uh, to Luke who asked the question if you have a specific application or any other um, details on the environment uh, please shoot Andrea an email and we can uh, get back to you with the recommendation accordingly but I would agree with her that those are typically the product families we're going to stick to um, if you need any sort of elastic memory or return properties that may influence our selection as well. Uh, next question, Andrea, is there a TPE that could potentially replace silicone? That would be kind of similar answer would be the additional requirements of it. Silicone tends to have really good heat performance that we're not quite able to reach if they're on the higher end of what silicone can handle. We're not really able to reach that necessarily with our TPE selection. Um, and then also it also has a certain feel to it, which we do have some options that can get us there. But again, if the requirement is that there's a certain heat performance that's needed, we might not make it. So it kind of depends on the other parts of the application and the other requirements that are there. Uh, but we would have some options that could get us close without necessarily hitting the heat performance of silicone. Thank you. Um, next question, can TPEs's styrenix also be vulcanized? Um, they do not vulcanize them because you do not have that in the styrenic um, elastomer segments as far as i know that they don't have the ability to do that they do it specifically for the epdm in your tpvs because you can vulcanize it and then create those cross links that give its properties yeah i'll add uh th there are other tpvs in the market um that don't necessarily publicize what elastomer they're using um i know that they are not epdm um, but typically the manufacturers consider that aspect of it proprietary. Um, I don't believe they're using styrenic based um, elastomers as those situations, but there, there are other elastomers being vulcanized for different end use properties, most commonly related to either thermal performance or, or enhanced mechanical properties. But we don't see those terribly often outside of the EPDM TPV world. Um, next question, what surface treatments for release are available? Uh, good question. So typically with these, because they're, they tend to be tacky, the majority of them, when we 
mold them and when we have finishes on our molds we want to see that it's got more of a roughed up surface finish um, because we want it to release better a polished surface is definitely not recommended for tpes it's going to tend to want to stick and it also is going to show all the flaws so if you have flow lines that are can be pretty prevalent in tpes if you have a polished mold it's going to show those so the texturing not only allows you to help release it from the mold it also will hide any of those imperfections that might be there Thank you. Um, next question uh, for a company that creates grommets over molded on the wires. Um, we find that different TPEs do not adhere to different wire types. Is there a list showing which TPEs are good for various wire types? And um, Greg, yeah, I mean, we'd welcome uh, an, an email from if you want to send it to Andrea. Um, I, I can uh, add to this real briefly to answer your question. In short, yes, there we definitely have an idea, maybe not a published list, of what type of materials bond uh, to different wire types. Um, most commonly, the issue that you will run into is that if the wire coating is PVC or crosslink polyethylene or something along those lines, there's very few thermoplastic uh, elastomers that will um, chemically bond to those without some sort of uh, primer. So um, we can take it offline and discuss the, the specifics of, of your wiring specifically and uh, see what would adhere to it. But um, generally, we can give some insight on it if we don't have a list per se to, uh, to throw out to you. Andrea, next question. How do you balance soft feel versus abrasion? And uh, what will the draw ratio do to haptic feel, quote unquote feel? So the first question would be more in line with the difference between the different types of materials is going to be pushing us more towards a certain type for abrasion. As we mentioned, the TPUs are to perform a lot better. So you could have a soft TPE all day. It's not going to perform as well in abrasion as your TPU. So if the question is more in line with, hey, I need something that's got a much much lower hardness than what we can achieve with TPU, um, we're going to probably have a hard time getting there. Um, because that's gonna really be what performs the best. It has more to do with kind of the chemical makeup of the material and how it's performing. Similar with your thermoplastics, certain ones just perform better with abrasion than others. And so the hardness is not as much of in play as the actual material selection itself. Um, I'll add to that for you, Eric. You know, Andrea is right. Typically it's an inverse correlation of uh, softness and abrasion resistance the softer you go the, the lack of abrasion increases or abrasion resistance increases um, the only way we can counteract that outside of just going to a softer tpu would be using something uh, within the compound that naturally has a lower coefficient of friction so for instance andrea mentioned earlier on in the presentation uh, the silicone vulcanizates uh, as, as part of the tpe so there's basically silicone particulate dispersed within that TPE compound, which naturally results in a lower coefficient of friction on the surface of the polymer while having the option to go relatively soft in terms of the uh, short A durometer range. So um, the short answer is you kind of have to go to a specialty compound that's designed for that. And even then it might not meet your abrasion resistance requirements, but there is some um, flexibility in the product selection to try to find a balance of your needs. Um, the second question there, Andrea, was what will draw ratio do to the haptic feel? That's a good question. I'm not sure on that one specifically. I would have to look more into it. Maybe you have a little more information on it, uh, but it's something that we could look into and get more information. It's not something I'm familiar with. Yeah. Um, the, the only thing that I would comment on there is that if there's enough strain in the polymer, it's certainly going to change the... Um, um, you know, the, the haptics of it, um, specifically increasing in, in hardness to a certain extent. So um, it, it might just take away from that softness of it would be my inclination. But again, we'd probably want to talk specifics of, of a part and material to give you a better idea on that one. Uh, next question, any recommendation for an industrial joystick, glass so nylon six substrate outdoor with oil resistance and about 90A? Um, Short answer is yes, and if you could shoot Andrea an email, we could get back to you on that one relatively quickly. Uh, I've, I've got a product in mind. We'd have to confirm the, the grade 
in oil resistance, but um, I can almost assuredly say yes, we sell into some uh, industrial type applications, drill housing, over molds, things like that. Um, that have to be resistant to um, oils in, uh, in that same durometer range with bonding to, to glass filled nylon six, and, and we're doing that successfully now. So I know we have some options. So if you could shoot an email to Andrea, Bill, that would be greatly appreciated. And the one thing I will say to add to that a little bit, because we talked about our overmolding and the chemical overmolding capabilities. The one thing to note that anything that takes away from the resin being on the surface to allow for the overmolding to occur is going to start making it a little bit more difficult to chemically bond to. Not to say that you can't, you can definitely do it, but stuff like glass or any type of filler that we're not actually chemically bonding to between your TPE and the sub hard substrate, it takes away from that a little bit. So we would write recommendations of the sorts of make sure that when you're, you know, if you're molding the nylon part, make sure it's very resin rich surface. So it allows for the TPE to over mold onto and stuff like that would be kind of a recommendation that we would make as well. Uh, next question, can you comment on the general price differences between TPEs and cross-linked elastomers like silicone, EPDM, and butadienes? I would say that I don't have the cost structure of those types of materials just because we don't deal with them too often or really we don't I mean we don't sell them so we don't deal with them so we don't actually know that so if you wanted to send a note we could get some information on that for you and get you more specifics on it but I know if, I mean the biggest one being if you're not you don't have the capabilities to run them because they're not ran in conventional thermoplastic fabrication techniques that's the biggest one too but then as far as transferring it over running it on standard equipment, and then the price of that specific material per pound, we would have to have a little more information on what you're seeing as far as those materials to compare it to what we have for our TPEs. Yeah, I think if you're looking at cost per pound with in certain scenarios, you know, butadiene or EPDM would run cheaper um, per pound than a TPE, but it's the production efficiency that, that brings the TPEs back into play from a, uh, processing time uh, timeline. Uh, silicone, it's kind of up in the air because that can be expensive as a raw material, expensive from a processing perspective due to the special equipment needed. Um, so there's definitely room for cost savings there as long as the application allows you to switch um, from silicone type heat performance down to a, a thermoplastic product. So um, we could take you know specific examples and try to give you a, a cost breakdown um, by working with you, but um, that's, that's kind of the, the general uh, overview from our opinion. Um, Andrea, the next question is, how do, how do you best handle sink and also sticking to the mold with TPEs? So the sticking to the mold would be kind of similar answer to that would have been the texturing. We make sure that we have enough texture to allow it to release. And then you said with sinks, it would yeah. be a, a similar concept. You want to make sure that you're creating and designing a part that, you know, isn't too thick. And so the specifics of, of what thickness would be allotted for it, we would have to get a little bit more into. So we could give and send more literature on that specifically for designing with TPEs. If you wanted to send me a note, we could do that. Um, but similar concept to what you would do with your thermoplastics. You make sure that your design is not too thick to, to start to allow sinks to happen. Um, same with like your ribbing design and stuff like that. And then um, the sticking to the mold, again, we want a textured mold with our TPEs for sure. Yeah, variations in wall thickness become a little bit more important with certain TPEs or TPVs when molding. Um, the, the potential difference uh, compared to molding a, a rigid material like polypropylene or, or ABS is that it's it gets more difficult to pack out a TPE at the end of fill without having aesthetic issues sometimes at the gate. You get a waviness or uh, unless you can do it all very quickly, which is hard to do in a thick walled part. So um, typically we look first to design and try to make sure that's right up front and then make minimal processing adjustments on the back end because we don't always have as much flexibility to change it as we would with um, some more standard uh, rigid polymers. Um, next question, our products are delivered across the country. Are there any issues of elastomer bonded to thermoplastic sheet becoming tacky in very high temps as in Arizona? As far as once the product is made, I'm guessing was the question. Yeah. Um, I would not imagine so. I'm sorry, you said the sheet was made out of what? Uh, just as thermoplastic sheet. Okay. Um, 
I, I can tackle this one if you want, but it typically during shipping, no, unless it's going to be really, really high temperature. So we, we see issues more sometimes in automotive, I'll, I'll use an example, that if you have sunlight coming through a windshield directly onto, you know, your central console, center console pad, there have been instances of the material starting to let go of any volatiles that are held within that TPE. So um, more than likely, it's not going to, you know, melt the rubber content of the material, but it might draw out some of the oils that were used to achieve the softness levels that we typically see for, for haptics and feel. Um, rarely do we see that in, in covered transit. Um, but you know, if it gets to a high enough temperature, it, it will draw out some of the, the nature of the material. So if we know ahead of time that that's gonna be the environment, we'll, uh, we'll look to a TPE that has that thermal threshold to be able to, to withstand it. Uh, next question, Andrea, is there a better type of gate for injection molding for TPEs? So that one. So as Jason has kind of mentioned, you have some that are a little more shear sensitive than others. So you're going to need to have your larger gates so not to introduce um, unnecessary shear when you're molding these parts. Uh, but I would say more of the specifics of each individual one will be dependent on the materials themselves. But it's something if you want to send us a note, we, same thing. We have literature on it to get you an idea. Also, you're, it's dependent just like your other materials on your part design and thickness of, that we're gating into and what type of gate you're wanting to use but we could definitely send more information if you wanted to send some specifics on it. Um, along those lines, Andrea, what's the best way to avoid cold slugs being forced into the part during the pack phase? Um, that's a good question. That one I will let you handle. You could probably talk to that a little bit more specifically yeah, than I, I mean, Ideally, we tried to handle it with a cold slug well if you're using a cold runner. Um, aside from that, if it's a, a hot, uh, tip or hot runner system, then it comes down to, to thermal management or having a place for the slug to go within the part, uh, like an overflow. So we kind of take those on a part by part basis, um, depending on the flexibility you have in the tooling and design a place for that cold slug to go um, if it can't be managed via uh, temperature. Uh, next question, overmolding on a nylon with oil resistance, uh, would you consider the COPE family or TPV family? Um, I would say both could be considered. I guess it would come in down to what the, I guess, additional requirements would be of it because they both have some good oil resistance. Um, your harder durometers with your higher propylene contents are going to be a little bit better with that type of resistance. Um, and so if it's something that you could get away with a higher hardness, I would, I would put it in a COPE would be your better resistance. But if you can, if you need something that's softer that we cannot achieve with COPE hardness, we could go TPV. And the other thing too is also the type of exposure and you know, always a few more extra questions to help with that recommendation, but those would be kind of the general lines that we would use. Yeah, if you need a softer product to overmold on a nylon as well, it might end up being a modified um, a styrenic based uh, type as well. So um, as Andrea said, we'd probably wanna go through a few more questions and, and narrow down the exact product for you. Uh, next question, can TBVs be electrostatic discharge materials? Um, yes. I mean, just like really any of your other <clears throat> thermoplastics, if you add the correct uh, filler to it to get it there, all plastics in general are going to be insulative. So when you get into the ESD type market and you need it to meet a certain range, depending on if you need anti-stat, stat dissipative, you know, whichever version of that you need, um, we would have a similar concept where we would add you know, your car conductive carbon black, or we would add your uh, carbon fibers. But at that point, you're kind of starting to get away from the draw of a soft touch material because you're starting to add some, you know, your carbon fibers that are going to add quote unquote hardness to it and make it a lot stiffer. So it's not necessarily performing just like the TBE beforehand, but I mean, you could do it for sure. Yeah, we've seen uh, a few compounds that have some mild electrostatic discharging. Um, it's a little more limited than some other uh, thermoplastics, rigid thermoplastics, only in the sense that the rubber content and the TPEs or TPVs naturally makes them uh, more insulating uh, from the get-go. So, um, Next question is, does uh, vulcanized silicone extrusions adhere to silicone caulking? 
Um, I don't know if we have those specifics on hand, but uh, we could certainly look into it. I, I'm, my inclination would be to say that it most likely doesn't um, without some sort of adhesive between the two. But uh, Andrea, have you heard of anything like that before? I've not, but what I've have, you know, what we've worked with a little bit is with your thermostat type rubbers and stuff. Ideally what happens, and again, this is maybe a little off topic from the, the initial question, but when you do your over molding, ideally what happens is you have a little bit of the surface that will melt. So then you can fuse the molten material coming in and then a little bit of the molten surface of what you're over molding onto. And so we have been asked questions about over molding onto stuff like that. Um, difficult being if it's already a silicone part, it's not gonna wanna melt back down and then have anything adhere to it. So, but as far as it already being a solid part and then the silicone being added separate, I have not been asked that question, but I would also have the inclination that it would not work. Perfect, thank you. Uh, next question, we're developing a product for a dog chew and need very high tear resistance in 81 Shore A. Um, Javed, I see your, your question here. If you could email Andrea with the specifics of what you need from, uh, include those details as well as, you know, if there's any color needs or regulatory compliance needs. Um, we certainly have had successes in the dog chew area and uh, would, would lean towards a certain family of polymers. Uh, we'd wanna make sure that we uh, button up all the all the details as needed. But um, if you could shoot Andrea a note ba based on the email you see there on your screen, um, we'd be happy to track that down for you. Uh, next question, any tips for reducing tiger striping when molding Sarlink? Um, that one I will let you tackle as well as far as the molding is concerned for it and the design. Yeah, I mean, typically it, with tiger striping, we're always going to look at, at the thermal settings first and foremost to try to increase flow. Um, if we're limited on what we can do with the barrel and the tool temperatures, then we're going to defer to back pressure and increase the shear at the gate. Um, specifically, we're, if we're looking at Starlink TPVs rather than TPEs, because uh, they tend to prefer that. now. Uh, the question that comes after that is really down to the nature of the part design. If you have a longer flow length or specifically something flowing over uh, a rib structure, um, you can get aesthetic defects that, that aren't necessarily traditional tiger striping, but does have uh, you know an aesthetic uh, fan type uh, appearance uh, striations. And, and when you do that, you might need to change your gate structure to allow for more even flow across those sections. Um, so it's it's not always a, hey, here's your silver bullet. We, we try to look at the parts specifically and figure, it, figure out how we can gate differently to make those hesitancies in flow or um, turns in the flow front different so that you don't get um, basically gloss changes throughout the part. Uh, looks like our last question here, um, Andrea. When doing a pull test on styrenic TPEs, I've seen breaking more than stretching, tearing. Why do you think that happens? Uh, is it too much polypropylene content? As far as uh, pull adhesion tests, I'm imagining they're asking. Um, that or maybe just a tensile test. I'm not sure, but maybe cater to both. Gotcha. So as far as the pull test and your state, there's, I'm sorry, they said that they're finding more breaking versus more of the stretching, correct? Correct. correct. Okay. So it could be, you're seeing a lot more. So the tensile, you're going to see it's better performing in more higher end or your rubbers and stuff like that. So your sirenic based TPEs are, um, they're just not going to perform as well in that type. They're just, they're not, they don't have as much tensile strength as some of the other uh, components in different TPEs. And so you're going to see that a lot more frequently. Um, and then other ones that have different rubber contents, your EPDMs, for instance, in your TPVs, they perform better in those tests and they give it better tensile strength and tensile performance than the styrenic based ones. Yeah, I'll add to that too, that with, with some TPEs, just like a lot of rigid uh, polymer compounds, um, some manufacturers, a lot of manufacturers, depending on the cost model, do use fillers. So they'll have materials in there that are used strictly to keep the cost down and sometimes have, has a mechanical performance uh, effect as well uh, to the negative extent. So um, if it's a 
down and dirty enough compound in some cases, it may have enough filler content in there, in there that it would have more of a, a brittle failure doesn't really sound right for TBEs, but less stretching than maybe uh, a compound with less fillers in it, um, or one that would have naturally higher mechanicals like uh, a TPV or others. And Jason, I see we have a hand up from Eric Unger. Eric, I'm going to unmute you. Did we already answer your question? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, everyone, that uh, that wraps up the questions that have come through. We really appreciate the great questions um, and you guys taking the time to uh, to listen to us for a while. Um, as Andrea and I and Sherry have all mentioned, we're, we're happy to, to help and we're here to help. So by all means, continue to bring the challenges to our technical team and we'll do our best to get you uh, into the right product, the right process uh, as needed. So thank you all and have a great rest of the day.